I'm very um, happy today to introduce our speaker to you, Harlan Lane. Um, Harlan is University Distinguished Professor in the Department of Psychology at Northeastern University. He's received the International Social Merit Award of the World Federation of the Deaf, among numerous other honors. An internationally recognized advocate for the deaf, the author of and editor of nine books on deaf history, language, and culture. Mr. Lane lives um, right here in Boston. And he's going to be speaking with us today about the artist, um, John Webster. So please help me welcome Harlan Lane. Thank you. Yes, the uh, occasion of my being here today is that I have just brought out a new book, which is called A Deaf Artist in Early America, The Worlds of John Brewster, Jr. And I understand from Michelle there are books here, and I'd be happy to sign uh, books, if anyone would like that. Now, Brewster, I call it the worlds of John Brewster Jr. because Brewster belonged to at least four worlds. He was, first of all, from a Puritan family. He was a seventh generation descendant of Elder William Brewster, who, of course, brought the Mayflowers, the uh, Puritans over on the Mayflower. Um, he was also a member of the Federalist elite, the post revolutionary merchant class that uh, also included uh, clergy and professional people. And uh, they were those whose portraits he painted. They were his sitters, as they say. Thirdly, uh, Brewster was a deaf man, so he belonged to the deaf world. And at a very interesting and exciting time, the deaf world was just coming together, creating structures, uh, developing a language of wider communication. And uh, finally, he was, of course, above all, an artist. An artist who gave us images of early America, uh, images of, I hope you'll agree, haunting beauty. Brewster was a limner, an itinerant portrait artist who did not honor many of the prescriptions of art in Europe, where contemporaries did study, for example, uh, John Singleton Copley and Gilbert Stuart. And so they adopted the grand manner style that uh, originated in France, in the Beaux-Arts, and uh, in England. Uh, and that was a very different style from the one that uh, indigenous American portraitists used. Working in that peculiarly American idiom, whose roots were in England, in fact, Brewster achieved a directness and intensity of vision that has rarely been equal. Art historians have called his portrait of Sarah Prince, for example, which is projected on the screen, quote, one of the masterpieces of American painting and, quote, a landmark in American painting. It's one of his most moving. The painting is also known as the Silver Moon after the sheet music on the piano. Sarah Prince here is lovely. I hope you agree. She's also very rich. Very few families could afford a piano in her time. The palette that Brewster has chosen is warm. The girl is poised, still. But the musical notes suggest gaiety. It's interesting to observe that Brewster painted two bars of the song and then stopped. I wonder what it must have been like for a man who was born deaf to paint uh, the portrait of a woman and include sheet music and the piano in his painting. Brewster's portraits, some valued at more than a million dollars, are to be found in numerous American museums. So don't think that after this talk you're going to slip out and buy a Brewster quickly. Uh, they're to be found, but they're terribly expensive. The uh, Museum of Fine Arts here in Boston, for example, has four Brewsters. So the next time you're at the MFA, you might want to go to that room in the American collection and look at the real thing, which is, of course, so much more powerful than a projected projection on a, on a screen. Now, Brewster was not an artist who incidentally was deaf. Rather, he was, I will argue, a deaf artist, one in a long tradition that owes many of its features and achievements to the fact that deaf people are visual people. 
This is a uh, portrait by John Brewster, Jr. Uh, when he was 33. The subjects are comfort star Mygat, a wealthy merchant of Danbury, Connecticut, and his daughter Lucy. What strikes me most about this painting are the eyes. They are superbly drawn. They return the viewer's gaze with a silent, penetrating look, much as I imagine Brewster himself did. And together with the other facial features, they project great clarity and directness of the personalities of the sitters. The austere background, the muted colors, and the careful composition are a backdrop for the complex humanity of the subjects and seem to place them almost in relief. Surely, this direct vision of the artist and Brewster's focus on vision must be related to his deafness from birth. Many of our contemporary deaf leaders have affirmed that deaf people are foremost visual people. And there is indeed, and it's quite interesting, a growing body of psychological research to confirm that people who grow up deaf have greater capacities in visual perception than do hearing people. Brewster painted Comfort Star's wife also, Lucy Knapp, and son George at about the same time. Here again we find the uncompromising clarity of the artist's vision. He talks honestly, using a brush to tell you what he saw. In deaf culture, straight talk is highly valued. These are deaf paintings because of their visual impact and directness. The painting documents the Mygots' most prized possession, their land and home. I should also say their children. Uh, all of these uh, were a mark of uh, accomplishment in the Puritan world. And you can see their positions, their possessions, some of them through the window in an optical feat. Uh, this was part of their achievement that they wanted recorded. The prosperity that followed the American Revolution created a new kind of hero and a new subject for immortalizing through painting, the prosperous Yankee, landholder, merchant, captain. Then too, with death from illness a commonplace, portraiture served to reassure the living and memorialize the recently deceased. Our contemporary eyes may blink at the portrayal of the children as small adults, but that apparently didn't offend clients at the time. Perhaps the differing images of childhood then and now are partly the result of the differing roles of children then and now. To say it in one sentence, children in those days very early became part of the hard-working family that uh, grew uh, crops and tended animals and uh, fought with the hard New England winters. Uh, so they took on very early the role of adults. And in my book, I make the case that uh, in some sense, childhood didn't exist in their time. The stiffness of the poses and the simplified drawing of the arms and hands are commonplace in this period. And they derive, I think, from the flat decorative manner characteristic of Elizabethan painting. Now, John Brewster, Jr. began his career only a few years before painting the Mygats. He was born in Hampton, Connecticut in 1766. And when he was 25, he took lessons in portraiture from a self-trained artist and minister in the nearby town of Scotland, Connecticut, Reverend Joseph Stewart. Around the time that Brewster painted the Mygats, his teacher, Stewart, painted their distinguished pastor in Scotland Parish, Reverend James Cogswell. Here's a painting of Cogswell by Stewart. You will have noticed perhaps some of the similarities between the pupil's work and his teacher's, such as the landscape view through the open window. <clears throat> 
Reverend Cogswell kept an extensive diary. An entry in 1790 provides one of the few scraps of direct information about John Brewster, Jr. Cogswell wrote, quote, Dr. Brewster's son, a deaf and dumb young man, came in the evening, and he's very ingenious. He has a genius for painting and can write well and converse by signs so that he may be understood in many things. He lodged here. And then uh, in February of 1791, the diary tells us more. Brewster, the deaf young man, was at my house when I came home. He tarried and dined here. He appears to have a good disposition and an ingenious mind. I could converse but little with him, being not acquainted with the signs. I pity him and thank God for the exercise of my senses. Now, it seems likely that it was Reverend Cogswell who introduced Reverend Stewart to the ingenious, deaf young artist, John Brewster, Jr. Brewster was no doubt looking for a career in a new nation that had made no provision whatever for its deaf citizens. There was no way uh, except private tutors to educate a deaf child. In 1796, Stewart and his family moved to Hartford where he opened a museum in the Connecticut State House. In the following year, his only son became gravely ill, and Reverend Cogswell's son, Mason Fitch Cogswell, a doctor, a, a widely admired physician, treated him until, alas, he died. Stewart continued to direct the Hartford Museum and paint local dignitaries until he died at age 68. Now, the Stewart style of painting, which he taught to John Brewster, Jr., was highly derivative of another and greater contemporary Hartford portraitist, Ralph Earle. Stewart not only studied Earle's portraits and painted in the manner of Earle, but he also copied several Earls. Since Brewster's master was Stewart, and Stewart copied Earle, let's look at a Hartford portrait by Earle a likeness of Reverend Cogswell's son, Mason Fitch Cogswell. We find here the precursors of the palette, pose, and compositional elements adopted by Stewart. Earl is clearly fond of his subject, who has a sweet smile and a dog at his side and uh, the painting combines the elements of the Grand Manor, which Earl had studied uh, in Benjamin West's studio, along with Gilbert Stewart and John Copley. So it has some of the elements of the high or Grand Manor art. Um, but it also has features of American provincial art, such as the candid likeness and the regional details of furnishing. Earl had found the artist's dream benefactor in Mason Cogswell. Mason was the son of a prominent minister. He was a nephew of Governor Huntington. He was an intimate of those famous or rich or both. Moreover, he officiated at three of the moments in life when the need for portrait was felt most sharply, birth, illness, and death. Most of Earl's Connecticut patrons for the next decades were Cogswell's patients or acquaintances. It was just at this time, as Earl established himself in Hartford under Mason Cogswell's patronage, that Stewart began giving lessons in art to John Brewster, Jr., and the Reverend Cogswell praised Brewster in his diary. In 1800, John Brewster, Jr. painted a picture of his father and mother, his uh, stepmother, Ruth Avery. Note the convention of the drapery and landscape, the characteristic pose, and the delicate handling of facial expression. There are also several conventional symbols of wealth, the shiny metal buckles on his father's shoes, the lawn, the leather-bound volume. Brewster was 25. He'd grown up in a cultured 18th century home with seven brothers and sisters. <clears throat> 
In 1795, John Brewster Jr.'s older brother, Royal, a physician like his father, moved to Buxton, Maine, little more than a wilderness encampment at the time. There, Royal married the pastor's daughter and had a house built across the road from the church. John Brewster Jr. soon moved in with his brother and sister-in-law and spent parts of 1796 and 1797 painting in nearby Portland. An advertisement in the Scotland, Connecticut Phoenix for September 28, 1797 states, quote, John Brewster Jr., portrait and miniature painter, informs that he is at Scotland Parish, ready to serve those in his art who may furnish him with business. N.B. For 17 months past, he has been improving his art at Portland. In 1798, Brewster advertised his availability in the Norwich, Connecticut Courier. The same year finds him in Danbury, Connecticut, running up a bill in a dry goods store for painter's supplies and comfort star my got on the store. So no doubt that was a exchange in which uh, Brewster did the portraits and in return got materials and perhaps contacts for further portraits. In 1799, Brewster's advertisements appear in the Poughkeepsie Journal. At the turn of the century, he stayed for an extended period in the home of a wealthy Saco, Maine landholder, Colonel Thomas Cutts, and painted many of the members of the family. Here's the colonel and his wife. I've said that the 19th century recast the hero as the bourgeois head of household. The colonel comes through in this likeness as a powerful and self-assured person and a severe descendant of Pilgrim Stock. These are the only full-length portraits, I, as I recall, of Brewster's work. And um, you notice that, for example, the colonel is all verticality except for a baton that slashes diagonally. And his wife is very much posed by cutting off the dress, which by implication goes outside the painting. It gives her a kind of groundedness and stolidness, which was their Puritan lot. In December 1801 and again in January 1802, advertisements placed in the Newburyport Herald announced that John Brewster Jr. was lodging at the home of Mr. James Prince, a wealthy merchant and customs collector, and he was available to take a likeness. Meet Mr. Prince and his son, William Henry. Prince had recently purchased his large brick house with extensive gardens and orchards where George Washington had once stayed and where General Lafayette was to be Prince's guest. Brewster lived in this richly furnished home for three months while he painted James Prince with son William Henry and did portraits of four of his other children. These paintings have been praised as, quote, veritable icons in the history of American folk art. We've already admired the painting of Sarah Prince at the start of this lecture. Brewster had a particular gift for painting children, and I think a particular fondness for children. Here's a charming two-year-old, Francis Watts of Kennebunkport, Maine, who went on to become president of the YMCA. His delicate lacy clothes, a Brewster hallmark, the delicate bird in his hand, and the lighting make him stand in relief. And they all contribute to a feeling of gentleness. The painting has a surreal quality for me, in part because the rules of perspective have not been followed, in part because of the stylized pine trees, which appear in other Brewster canvases. The bird on a string is symbolic of human mortality, for like the child's soul, it is free to fly only after the child's death. 
Because children commonly died so young, the image was often employed. One of the things that makes Brewster so attractive to the modern eye, I think, is the affinity of some of his portraits with modern art in the absence of perspective and the simplification of contours. With this painting, Brewster commenced signing his canvases in pencil on the stretchers. The charming child portrait known as One Shoe Off is signed and dated 1807. Disorderly attire, even as simple as a child with one shoe off and one shoe on, implied a rebellious nature. And I see a little touch of the devil in her. In the year Brewster painted Francis Watts, 1805, Mason Cogswell and his wife celebrated the birth of their third child, Alice. After Helen Keller, Alice Cogswell is probably the best-known deaf woman in history. Before Alice turned two, she contracted spotted fever, as it was then called, and lost her hearing and speech. For several years, her family tried fruitless remedies and watched painfully as her older sisters grew up as cultivated and educated young women and developed and learned while Alice did not. Mason Cogswell at once saw the larger human problem. He approached some of the many people of wealth and influence in Hartford, created an organizing committee to found the first school for the deaf, and persuaded his neighbor, Thomas Gallaudet, to go overseas to learn methods of deaf education. The Connecticut Asylum for the Education of the Deaf and Dumb opened its doors in Hartford in April 1817 with seven pupils. The first listed was 12-year-old Alice Cogswell. There were five more pupils, all in their teens, and then there was one John Brewster, Jr., age 51. Yes. John Brewster, Jr. enrolled in school at the height of his successful career and suspended his art. I imagine Brewster and Gallaudet meeting, though there's no record of it, but it must, of course, happen. Gallaudet was the principal of the school. And he would have said to Brewster, you can't be a student here. The desks that we made are too small. You, there's no way. And then, then there's the age difference. And, and then Brewster would have said, I think, ah, but I can pay. And that made all the difference at that delicate moment in the history of deaf education. In any event, he stayed three years. And then he uh, returned to Maine and to painting. Now, how very different Brewster's style was from the academic painting practiced in Europe at this time. I've chosen as an illustration the work of a French deaf painter whose name was Frédéric Pesson a student of the renowned artist Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres, I-N-G-R-E-S. At the Paris Arts Salon of uh, 1839, Payson presented his interpretation of a legendary event in deaf history, the last moments of the founder of worldwide deaf education, the Abbé de l'Épée. In the painting, Epe is shown blessing his deaf pupils from his deathbed. He's attended by a delegation come to tell him that the revolutionary government has adopted his school as a national institution, and therefore the education of the deaf will go forward. Here's Peyson's painting of that historic moment. Not only is there a delegation close to his bed, but there are parents and pupils there to pay homage to the man long known as the father of the deaf. Their distress is portrayed in exaggerated and conventional symbols. Uh, eyes roll to heaven. Uh, that was French academic painting. And it was said to be mute poetry. And who better to write such poetry, mutely, with a brush, than a mute, one who communicates with signs. Uh, 
the Abbé de Lépé actually made the point explicitly, and I quote him, like painting, the art of signs is a silent language which speaks only to the eyes. The entire scene is presented as a frozen instant. The painter affects the illusion that he's caught people in mid-gesture. Significantly, Paisson signed the painting Frédéric Paisson, sur muet, deaf mute. By using the official style of the academy, the grand manner, and by signing their paintings deaf mute, deaf painters like Paisson were making a point and striking a blow for their minority. They were asserting the normalcy of deaf people and their capacity for abstractions such as beauty and homage, capacity which many people doubted since they knew no educated deaf people. In 1823, the year Brewster's father died, uh, our artist was painting in Maine and New Hampshire. The number of his paintings that have been uncovered at any rate begins to diminish in these years, and his last painting was apparently completed in 1834 when he was 68 years old. In these later years, his portraits show a more nuanced and somber appreciation of personality. His signed painting of Reverend Daniel Marrett of Standish, Maine, is representative. Let's take a look. You see the face is heavily modeled with rose and uh, gray shadowing to bring out the features. Uh, there's a certain sobriety and determination in this man of the cloth. Um, the folded sermon in his hand starts with the words, to meet thy God is a solemn, and the pastor appears solemn indeed. No trace of our artist again for the next 17 years but in 1852, he witnessed his niece's will. Two years later, in 1854, John Brewster Jr. died and was buried in Torrey Hill Cemetery at the age of 88. John Brewster Jr. left behind a great corpus of moving portraiture. My book includes an inventory of some 250 portraits, and some are still being found, if not every month, every few months to the great joy of the unsuspecting owners. Brewster left behind a vision, a frank and honest way of seeing people. He left behind a testimony to the perceptiveness, artistic gifts, and ingenuity of deaf people. Brewster did not understand with his ears. Brewster understood with his eyes, his hands, and his mind. And to quote Victor Hugo, what matters deafness of the ears when the mind hears? Thank you very much. I ask everybody to use the microphone just because we're on film today, so I'm going to pass it around. Uh, Professor Lane, uh, in reviewing his work for your book, uh, what were your principal sources of... Uh, the troves, where, where was the stuff that you looked at? Are, are they in private collections at other museums? Where, where is it? The, uh, the table in my book actually gives the, the location of the works where known. A great many of them are in museums, like the MFA, the Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller Collection, of course, in Williamsburg, the uh, American Museum of Folk Art in Manhattan. Uh, they're, they're quite scattered. There will be a, a Brewster traveling exhibit based on my book, uh, starting in 2005, but mostly in 2006 and 2007. Uh, the nearest it's going to get to Boston, I'm sorry to say, is uh, Portland or Old Lyme, Connecticut. I'm not sure which is closer, but it will be uh, in Maine in a couple of venues uh, and also in Connecticut and all the way on down the coast to uh, Orlando, Florida. Uh, but many, we don't know where they are. They're in private collections, and the owners prefer not to be identified. <clears throat> I think I may have seen some at Old Sturbridge Village. Is that possible? Yes, it is. 
uh, Brewster's parents, uh, the, the painting of his parents that we saw is to be found at Old Sturbridge Village. And they also have um, a, a nice collection of other work from that period. And there's the, um, the Shelbourne Museum in Vermont. They have a, a Brewster, so they're, they're scattered. There's a wonderful one in Houston, one in the university, uh, not university, Pennsylvania State University. Yes, sir. Where did you say that Sarah Prince portrait is? Uh, that's in a private collection. Oh. By the Prince family? No. Uh, a woman who inherited it from her mother who had the judgment to buy it a long time ago. Oh. Yeah. Professor Lane, with this book and the other books you've written, where did your interest in the deaf community come from in the beginning? Hmm. People... To make this book? How long did it, your research to make this book? Well, it's a little misleading because uh, I did it in spare time, so to say, while I was teaching and doing research and other things. Uh, but it was scattered over a period of about a decade. My friend David Feltner here in the orchestra was a huge help to me in uh, intruding on the lovely people who live in Brewster's house in Maine and unearthing documents there in, in Buxton and in uh, other, other locales. So it was a long and uh, almost like a hobby in a way. Let's see, now you had another question too. Yeah, my, where did my interest come? Um, my background is in psychology and linguistics. And I was introduced to sign language and the deaf in 1973. And I thought it was just a fascinating opportunity to understand language and, and our it, it made me f feel that my sense of my humanity was expanded. There was more richness, there was more to my humanity than I knew before. And um, then I became politicized also by my deaf friends. And here I am. 